What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here and I am back from my vacation and well rested and I'm ready to dive into making new D&D content for you. Hopefully you enjoyed all the videos that came out over the week while I was on break and on vacation. I tried to make sure I had something interesting for every day and it seems like a lot of you did enjoy that. So I did wanna also say while well, my birthday is on the 12th, I'll be turning 35, so happy early birthday to me. Uh, let's try to shoot for that 100K mark for Gen Con so we can have a celebration there. But that's really up to you and your friends, or I guess your enemies or my enemies. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, and if you like this stuff and help me reach that 100,000 uh, subscriber mark, I wanna hang that play button on the wall behind me. So anyway, uh, I'm starting a new campaign streaming here on actually this YouTube channel. And then the, all, the VODs will be up on our secondary gameplay channel, Nerd Immersion Plays, within the week of after the, the, you know, the game actually streams, called Scalebound. And uh, I'm actually going to be playing a monk in that game. And that led me to this build that we're going to be discussing here. And I did want to take a moment to thank you, the viewers and the fans, for encouraging me to make variety content. Uh, and, you know, it's still all D&D for the most part, but there are a lot of mainstays here, right? Like news coverage and top 10 videos that you expect from me as soon as they happen or every week. But you really do seem to encourage the concept of me branching out and trying new things, talking about DMs Guild stuff, or, you know, making a hypothetical video, doing a D&D story, or in this case, making a character build. And I really do appreciate that because it keeps things fresh for me. It also draws in new viewers who are looking for different things or reinvigorates old viewers to say, oh, hey, look, he's doing that kind of content again. So I do really appreciate that. So anyway, like I said, I'm going to be playing a monk in this game coming up on Tuesday. And I was while well, I've decided my build is not going to fall, is not going to be the same as this, it did give me pause and make me want to possibly change this. And I think this might be one of the tankiest and most interesting and one of the highest damage dealing monks out there and it doesn't even involve the subclass at all so it's going to involve xanathar's guide to everything a feat from that and the class features uh, alternative class features from tasha's cauldron of everything so if you don't use those well then this video won't work for you so first let's start with the monk class itself there's a couple things we need to understand it's really two features one is the martial arts feature here which is you know, when you use unarmed strikes or monk weapons, which are typically any short sword or simple weapon that doesn't have the two-handed property or the heavy property, you can use dexterity instead of strength for attack and damage rolls. That's important because we're making a dex build. And then also is the second level ability, uh, the key ability here, patient defense, which is you can spend one key point to take the dodge action as a bonus action on your turn. Those are the two crux abilities. And really, like I said, anything after that is gravy. Um, it really only needs two levels in the class to tap into this, and in theory, you could possibly multi-class out if you wanted to and not have to worry about that. The next important thing is the uh, dedicated weapon feature here from the optional class features from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and that is you train yourself with a variety of weapons as monk weapons, not just simple weapons and short swords. Whenever you finish a short or long rest, you can touch one weapon, Focus your key on it and count that weapon as a monk weapon until the feature uh, you use this feature again. The weapon must be a simple or martial weapon. This is the tricky part that a lot of you suggested when I asked about weapons for my monk. You must be proficient with it. So everybody's saying, well, with the dedicated weapon feature, you can use this end as a monk. Well, the important part is you have to be proficient with the weapon. Now, you could take feats or some other things, but the easiest way to get proficiency with a weapon without multi-classing would be to have your race give you that opportunity. Now, there's also, with the Tasha's Cauldron of Everything rules, where you can swap uh, proficiency. So if you have proficiency with a martial weapon that you don't want to use as a monk weapon or it doesn't fit into the monk weapon here, you could swap it for something else. So that's an option for you. And then it can't have the heavy or special properties, right? So you can't be using things like a net and you can't be using things like a great sword. Okay, so that's important. What we're going to be playing is a dwarf. And specifically, we will be playing a hill dwarf. So obviously, as a base dwarf, we can ignore constitution and the ability scores because we'll be using Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and customizing our ability scores to realistically probably pick either dexterity and wisdom, depending on how we generate our stats, or dexterity and constitution, or dex, you know, or whatever it works out to be, depending on how your ability scores are determined. Um, you still have the low movement speed as a dwarf, but that's not really important because you're going to get the improved movement speed as a monk. You've got dark vision. You've got advantage on saving throws against poison and resistance to poison damage. That's useful early on. Eventually, as a monk, will be immune to that. And here it is. Dwarven combat training. Battle axe, hand axe, light hammer, and war hammer. 
Now, personally, I'm uh, fond of the Battle Axe in this scenario, but it would work just the same with the Warhammer. Uh, and you can essentially trade out Hand Axe and Light Hammer proficiency for tools if you want to give more tool options to your monk. And then if you don't want to use, if you want to just say focus on Battle Axe or Warhammer, you can trade out the other one again for another tool proficiency. So not only do you have those potentially three new tool proficiencies, you'll have a tool proficiency from being a monk and a tool proficiency uh, from being a dwarf of either smiths, brewers, or masons tools. So you're looking at anywhere between one, three, um, yeah, you're pretty much without dealing with your background at all. You've got five tool proficiencies here. Remember, that could be Poisoner's Kit, that could be Thieves Tools. You could have a lot of variety there. And then, again, we're going to focus on the Hill Dwarf. So, again, the Wisdom normally increases by one, but with Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, we can swap that to be anything. And you have Dwarven Toughness. So, as a monk, your hit die is a D8, but this now gives you one extra hit point every level as you level up. So now you've pretty much crossed over into pretty much a D10 hit die at this point, which is pretty nice. You're now a significantly more tanky monk than you would normally have been, which is nice. And because of what we talked about with you getting, as part of a base dwarf, battle axe or warhammer, we can use the dedicated weapon feature of turning that into a monk weapon. And what's nice about the, let me go back to the, uh, it doesn't actually link us to the battle axe, does it? No. Um, which I forgot to do. So let me go ahead and pull up equipment real quick from the player's handbook, and uh, we can take a look at the weapons. So if we scroll down to a battle axe, we can see that a battle axe is a D8. It does not have the heavier special properties, but what's important is it is versatile in that it can do a D10. So with the dedicated weapon feature, you can be a monk at level two who is a dwarf who is more tanky and survivable than other monks because of your extra one hit point. You now can wield a two-handed, you know, take your one-handed battle axe and wield it two-handed, and you can be doing a d10 damage from level two as a monk. And it's dexterity-based because of the dedicated weapon feature comboing with your martial arts feature, which is pretty nutty because to get that kind of damage on a monk with, say, an unarmed strike you have to go all the way to level 17 in Monk to be able to punch for a D10. Whereas at level two, even if you do the funky shenanigans by using the fighting style feat to get yourself access to uh, the unarmed fighting style from the fighter, that still only caps you at a D8. Now again, you could potentially do that as well and your unarmed strikes would deal a D8 or a D6 uh, because again, you can always attack with your attack action using the ax, but for your bonus action attack or your flurry of blows, you are limited to uh, only unarmed strikes, but we have a better use for our bonus action. So just to reiterate, you can be wielding your battle axe, which I feel like every time someone has a versatile weapon like this, they never really use the versatile property of it because they're always using the one-handed weapon with a shield. Well, as a monk, to benefit from your unarmed uh, armor, you know, your unarmed, uh, what is it called? Unarmored defense? Your, uh, uh, yeah, your your ability to have that dexterity plus wisdom added to your uh, your AC. You can't use a shield, so you couldn't get any benefit from that. So why not wield the battle axe two handed and do that D10? But we're a dwarf. What does that mean? It gives us access to this dwarven feat from Xanathar's Guide, Dwarven Fortitude. You can increase your constitution score by one, and whenever you take the dodge action in combat, you can spend one hit die to heal yourself. Roll the die, add your constitution modifier, and regain a number of hit points equal to that total. So that's pretty decent. Your hit die as a monk is a d8. You have potentially a pretty decent constitution modifier, that depends, and you regain a number of hit points equal to that total. Well, as we said with the monk, for one key point, we can patient defense to take the dodge action as a bonus action. So now, on our turn, when we're at least level 5, we could swing with our d10 battle axe to do 1d10 plus our dexterity modifier damage twice. And if we wanted, we could take oh, spend one key point as a bonus action to take the dodge action. And then as part of that, triggering Dwarven Fortitude, allowing us to roll our hit die at our constitution modifier and heal that amount. So that's something we can do. Now we are limited to the number of hit dice because remember our key points come back on the short rest, but our hit dice are limited to a long rest. You only get half of your hit dice back on a long rest. 
but that could be a very big heal for you. And I wanted to point out that the durable feat technically would come into play here if you took this as well by allowing you to limit uh, the number of hit points you regain when you roll a hit die is limited to only be twice your constitution modifier. But that's not as important as this item. The uncommon, which I will point out is an uncommon item, and normally I've seen these thrown out pretty frequently. If you're playing in pre-written campaigns, I've seen them come up a bunch. But the uncommon magic item that does require attunement, the periaptive wound closure. While you wear this pendant, you stabilize when you're dying at the start of your turn, which is nice. But what we want it for is whenever you roll hit dice to gain hit points, double the number of hit points that are restored. So as a reminder, we can, as a bonus action, uh, whenever we take the dodge action by spending one key point to do patient defense, roll a hit die, add our constitution modifier together, and then with the periaptive wound closure, take that number and then double it. And that is the number of hit points we could heal, potentially, I'd say every turn, but obviously we're limited by hit dice as a bonus action. So let's say, we'll say you happen to get a 16 constitution. That's not unreasonable. So that's a plus three bonus. So and we'll take the average roll of your hit die being a four. That is four plus your constitution modifier of a three. So we have seven with the periaptive wound closure. We just healed uh, 14 hit points as a bonus action on our turn while we still had our full action available to it and our base movement speed that we would normally have for being a monk. And like I said, all of this involves a feat, uh, a couple of class features that you could technically have access to, one uncommon magic item, and we haven't even touched on any of the subclasses. So you have basically all of these monk subclasses or homebrew or whatever else options for you to change this up however you want. I don't particularly see Kensei monk being a great option for you because you've got the weapon you needed from being a dwarf and using the dedicated weapon feature so i would probably branch out and try something else but you have a ton of options for you like we said you're going to be a high dex build you probably could have access to thieves tools relatively easily so you could be a pseudo rogue we haven't even touched on what your background would give you which could potentially give you more tool proficiencies or languages it's just a very good, in my mind, all-around character build. I know people sometimes have a problem where they don't like monks or they hate monks. I see it kind of go both ways. People think that monk is a really boring class because a lot of its options are sort of... There's no real flashy options, in my opinion. Those kind of come from the subclass, depending on the one that you choose. But you don't really have any dead levels as a monk, which is nice, where you're gaining a feature all the time. And you get a lot of good passive things, which I also enjoy. And, you know, kind of one, usually one of the biggest problems people have with a monk is the low damage output, right? Usually dealing, if you're stuck with unarmed strikes or something like that, you're either wielding a quarter staff, which is not necessarily the most interesting weapon, depending on how you feel about it, or you're doing D4 punches. Now you can be doing a D10 axe attack every turn or a hammer. Like I said, Warhammer works as well, but I like the idea of you wielding kind of being this martial arts master and you're wielding a battle axe. And again, you have the survivability and the tankiness from being a hill dwarf. Not to mention, again, all of the great benefits of being a dwarf up front, right? Like having the dark vision, having the uh, resistance to poison damage, stone cunning. It's, you know, it's situational, but it is useful. You have a lot of good stuff going for you there. And then again, you have all of this stuff. And potentially if your game has, um, you know, certain access to magic items that might be uh, restricted to dwarves, there are certain magic items that only a dwarf can use. Um, but yeah, I, I think I like the concept of a Dexy dwarf wielding a battle axe and it working well. And again, you have a lot of opportunities to round yourself out with a different skill, a bunch of different tool proficiencies. And I think that that's pretty sweet as well. Obviously, again, one of the main benefits I'm choosing of hill dwarf is the tankiness. But if you needed the ability scores, you could go mountain dwarf and get plus two plus two. You wouldn't have as much tankiness, but you could still wield the battle axe and do the dwarven fortitude periaptive wound closure, bonus action, healing, and then you would obviously get light armor and medium armor, which if you're planning to be a monk, you wouldn't need, and you could trade those away for more tool proficiencies, add two more to your list. So anyway, folks, this was just a fun idea that I kind of came up with that I heard. I thought of the concept of the dwarf monk in the past using dwarven fortitude and patient defense as an option, right? That was something that I definitely remember people discussing. And I think I even discussed it at one point on the channel. And that was cool, but I didn't think it was that great. 
And then I forgot about the perioptive wound closure when discussing it back then, but the concept of getting this axe or these proficiencies, which are then used by the dedicated weapon feature is pretty sweet. Now, again, like I said, there's other options, right? Like you could be a an elf monk and that would give you access to the long sword or the, you know, the long sword being the kind of the main one that you could focus on that and make it be your dedicated weapon. And then you could have a sword, but either way. So let me know, folks, what do you think? This I don't know what I would call this build. I'm sure you guys will give me great suggestions in the comments down below. But I thought it would be an interesting build, and I definitely could see a lot of my friends who don't like to play monks or have it in their head that they don't or wouldn't enjoy playing monks changing their mind and wanting to play a monk if it's designed like this, especially if they're a fan of dwarves. Like I said, there's obviously ways around this. If you choose a different race that gives you access to uh, a weapon, you could obviously get this and have the cool high-powered weapon, but it doesn't benefit the same way as it would from Dwarven Fortitude. So anyway, folks, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all next time.